Okay, so next up we have Connor Rogers and Ryan Gibbons, and they're going to be talking about CNCF best practices for software supply chain. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's great to be here at the CNCF conference. Uh, my name is Connor Rogers. Um, I'm a technology leader with Stalagen Systems. Uh, we're a branch of emphasis. And we're an AWS consultancy partner. Um, I'm lucky enough to have gotten the opportunity to work with Ryan after 25 years in old school configuration management, build management, release management, technical management, lean, agile, all this kind of stuff. I get the opportunity to work with a security team in 3M, of which Ryan is a senior leader. Right, Ryan Gibbons, um, it's great to work with Connor. We have a lot of fun together. You'll see that while we talk today. Um, I'm part of the 3M digital science community, so 3M is, yes, they make the post-it notes and all the things you're used to, but we also have a technology kind of incubator here in, in Dublin. Well, I'm in Spain now, but. Um, I started as a developer many years ago and uh, then spent um, a lifetime in information security, so when they said, hey, security's starting to shift left back in development, I said, sign me up, so we have a lot of fun together. And we're gonna tell a little bit of story <laughs> that started a couple years ago. On, on how our journey has progressed along this whole paradigm of shifting security left. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. But first, can I find out just what, how the audience is distributed, technical or more like program? So how many folks primarily spend their time working on technical problems, show of hands? Okay, and how many are more like on the projects and programs and the resources? Okay, so mostly technical, but a scattering a few. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here's, here's the situation, framing it, not particularly for 3M, but just in general, um, they're shifting left again, and, and I always like to say, this is, guys, this is shifting left. This is not dumping left. <laughs> this is not a push, this should be a pull, right? We need to give developers the tools and the, the capabilities and the training and everything else they need so we can move this responsibly and not just have audit and compliance go, hey, developers, you do all the stuff now. Um, there's a huge lack of awareness in the software supply chain, uh, Right, we've been doing manifests and things for many, many years, but that some people are still kind of uh, new to some of these things, so that's okay. We've got, um, there's limited guidance. It's been getting better over the last couple of years, but when we started this journey a couple of years ago, there was kind of sparse. You could read some DOD documents, and NIST had some things, and they were really focused on kind of traditional SDLC type of things, but, but not necessarily the tool chain, so, so there were some problems. Um, SolarWinds raised awareness quite a bit. Is everybody here, I'm sure? Is aware, Salsa from Google also helped quite a bit. And uh, to do this, we started, as I mentioned before, big company, 3M, very diverse technical environment, so a little bit challenging, lots of different groups. Oh, and one other thing I want to mention here, and then, yeah. So on the security integration little circle we have there, um, we, we had a lot of coverage in, in the whole operate, right? So that's the traditional space where the stuff runs. And in the plans, they had all these risk things you had to go through and, and, and architecture reviews and everything else. But as soon as it goes to build, it was like, just scan your code. And that seemed really That's empty. right, that's right. Um, I come from a lean background, release management, DevOps, better, faster, cheaper, better, faster, cheaper. Let's go faster, let's get us out there, shorter increments. And oftentimes, in my career, DevOps was conflicted against legacy style security organizations. Uh, it's the department of no, but no. Ryan's focus here is to improve the security posture of the application code delivery. And what that means is not being the department of no, it means being department of collaboration, okay? And first time ever I got to work in a DevOps agile way with a security team that builds solutions. Okay, we like this. Yeah, yeah. That makes it so much more fun. We get to be the builders, not the no people. So how this worked at uh, 3M, we really, we knew, we're kind of introducing an entirely new category of, of considerations for senior executive leadership. So I, I had to be able to tell this as a story. I had to capture their imagination. I had to get them bought into that this is a thing and we're going to need to spend time and prioritize the resources away from just delivering stuff to making sure how we deliver it is secure. So 3M knows supply chains. They're very good at this stuff. They've seen some briefings from how they do it, and they're fantastic. Um, so I just needed to leverage what I already had, and, and of course, everything in here, you have to adapt to your own organizations. But for us, it was, okay, they understand supply chains. So um, I actually used this image when uh, CNCF released it, but 
I had an earlier version of this, which wasn't as good. You guys know supply chains, so you have materials and you build the thing and then you have to deliver it to your store and then it gets consumed. Software is the same way. This was new for them because they don't, didn't know software quite as well. Software, you have components and code and you bring them in and you have to compile them together in a pipeline and then you, you, know, you put it into an operating environment. It's kind of like sending it to a store. So I had to use what they understood and put it in terms that they get and I knew I was being successful when I started hearing about this in other meetings. Oh yeah, there's this team doing the secure software supply chain. So that's how I kind of captured this interest that we need to secure our software supply chain, yeah. just like you have physical security controls. Yeah, I'm, I'm an SDLC guy. I've always been SDLC. And you've got to realize, everybody must realize at this stage, you know, it is a complete software supply chain. And a lot of the components are coming from the outside. And a picture tells a thousand words. What Ryan isn't telling you here is how diverse our organization is and how many different SDLCs we have, and how many different approaches. And we've got some legacy and we've got some very, very contemporary innovative approaches as well. And the executives that Ryan has to deal with uh, are many and diverse. And they don't often have a lot of time to uh, read the big document or take it in. So, a picture tells a thousand words, and that's part of you know, our knowledge um, propagation upwards, but also downwards, and that's sure. very important in the space that we play in. Yeah, we had, to, we had to make sure that this story was going both up and down, and so we actually had different versions of how we would message it depending on who our audience was, very important, and we enhanced that with the data that we had. So, I mean, what is um, the critical security control number one? What's number one? You may know this one? 20 critical controls used to be called? Yeah. Nope, not firewalls. Good one. Is that users? The user is very important to, to I mean, the user's kind of in, in all those things, but most of um, what they teach you in the, the, the you know, critical security controls is you start with an inventory because you can't protect what you don't know. And then you have to know both in hardware and software inventory, and then you kind of go along. So we're like, well, let's follow the same pattern. I mean, we're doing a security piece. Let's follow the best practices. So step number one, how much code do we have? And how many components do we have in our environment? And how many build pipelines? And how many code repositories? And how many, like, let's, let's just identify all that. And to make it fun, we kind of went to a lot of the tech leaders and said, how much do you think you have? How much, how much do you think you have? How many code repositories do you have? How many? <laughs> yeah, so I, I really like this. <clears throat> Ryan leads with, with vision, okay? But up above vision, you need something. You need something, you need principles and standards. And that allows you to be tool agnostic, okay? You bring it up to what does good look like? Let's not worry about what the brand name or the tool name or the software utility name is. We start up there at that higher level. Uh, yeah. Then we can work downwards. And that, that was a lot of fun. And so then at the end, we kind of showed how much, how many different types of technology and how much code each group had against each other. It, it's nice to have kind of healthy visibility, I'll say, not necessarily competition, but just like, so you have this much, this person has this much. You thought you had a lot, look at this guy, right? And so having an organization lever, that, that makes them sit up and pay attention. Oh, how am I doing against the people I'm having to compete for resources with? So we kind of got into that conversation and then they started using what us and what we found is, yeah. is um, part of the conversation. So you can lead with your threats and say, this is the current news, this is the current hack. And what's your exposure? What's the probability of that happening? So you have to have visibility and discovery of your inventory, at your yeah. source code level, at your build level, at your orchestrator level, at your deployment level. God knows the old uh, CMDB, yeah. you know, where has it gone to? Okay, where is it on our outside? And indeed, all of our internal tools are critically important as well because that's where the software supply chains attacks are coming. They're not coming on your perimeter. They're going inside and they hit much more when they get out. Yeah, and that, that helped us to tie it to risk. So, um, and we, we built some reputation too. So where did we start? So on our team, just a little bit of uh, context. So I set the kind of general scale, but just for us, we already had an um, application security program. It had been running for a while. We kind of started a new one. We called it the code security team because we don't deal so much with the runtime environment. We're just, we're all the way until you build it. And, and then once it's built and we, we secure the tool chain and all the tests, of, you know, then other teams are. So we kind of carved our little niche. Um, we'd already been 
we had some resources, some people, we had already been um, looking at some of the best practices. So, so that's kind of where we were. We weren't just starting out when this document yeah. came. So just a little bit of context um, from, from where our journey goes in here, you'll see that you know, we'd, we'd already kind of started and we'll talk about. Yeah, so we came here to tell you a little bit more about our story and how the CNCF helped us. And that's really the message that we're here to give you is that there's a really good artifact that people should look at and read that's it. and how it came to us and how we were able to leverage that. Yeah. And how we were able to communicate that to our organization. And, and we always use, so while we're on this journey, so <laughs> we had started, SolarWinds came out and really advanced the conversation. And it went from my, my boss and boss's boss saying, so, what are you guys doing out there exactly? How does this relate to so and so? And then, then it was like, oh, solar winds, <laughs> right? So now I was on the table, which is nice. No, right. um, and then a year later, we've got Log4j, and everybody's like, hey, can you guys come help? So we've made a lot of progress in the last year. So there's some cultural messages here as well. So Ryan is a great cultural leader. He's got a security vision. He also has a good security team. But underneath that, if you're building solutions, you've got to have some good technologists. Yeah. Okay. So. We want to build cloud native technology solutions that are enterprise available for a vast enterprise. So good vision, good strategy, good culture. We're lean, we're agile, and we got some good technologists to put that kind of technology in underneath the security best practices. Not everybody is a security expert. We all can't be security experts. Not everybody can be a full stack engineer, but we have to have some specialists to put some meat on the bone. Yep. So we had, had good people on the team and a good, good partnerships. And we actually started, this was our strategy before the CNCF best practices document came out. So this is, we're gonna show you before and after. Because we, um, first, it was nice because it mapped pretty well, and second, we made some improvements. So we wanted to re release these capabilities. So we talked about before, shifting security left is not dumping everything on developers. So we wanted to build capabilities that help developers to be able to handle these new demands that compliance and everybody else is putting on them. So we approached it, hey, we're your partners. We're gonna help you protect the code in, in the code repositories. We're gonna help you make sure you're getting the right licenses. We're gonna make sure you've got clean components and have tools and, cap and, and environments and repositories like we just heard from to do that. Um, we're gonna make sure that the scans are done and that they're easy and then, and then get a little fuzzy at the end. We're like, yeah, and build pipelines. We didn't have a lot of thoughts there yet because we were kind of just starting that, but, but that we knew that that was gonna be a big focus. We had some resources assigned to it. So, this was our yeah. starting place. It was great. Um, it was early 2021. I started working with Ryan. He started talking to me about a strategy. And this is so appealing to me. OK? It's simple. And it covers a lot of my career, actually, to date. <laughs> you know? But it's very much a capability view at this point. I mean, what are we going to do? Protect our source code. Do some SCA scanning. Do some credentials discovery. Um, use good components. Yep. And then out here, we got this big piece of securing the pipelines. Yeah, which we didn't have well-defined. We were doing some basic things, and we'll talk about that a little and, bit later. And we were just calling it securing our application source yeah, code. That's right, that's right. Yeah. So, picture tells a thousand words. Okay, DevSecOps, what's DevSecOps? What does it mean across the SDLC? And for me, you know, it was always, can we get the code from here to the customer as quickly as possible. Was it a waterfall? And then we go agile. Now we can do this faster. And then in the new world, okay, we're taking in these components. We were always taking customer off the shelf components, but now there's huge amounts of OSF. And the attacks are coming the whole way along here. I'm saying to Ryan, you know, Ryan, you know, if we're gonna protect the front door, we gotta stop the stuff coming in at the back door. Let's protect our ingestion boundary. So I drew this picture. And I tried to make it principles and standards based and agnostic. Okay. Yeah. And agnostic. And, and we needed a map to have these conversations because we'd jump in and go, okay, remember this part in the pipeline? We need to start talking about that. And people would just, like, half the people in the room just check out. So, okay, let's build the map. Um, we'll get input from other people. And uh, didn't get as much input as we thought. They were just like, yeah, okay, that's, I mean, we, could, we can have conversations here. You've got some major processes. We didn't want to make it too detailed, and we didn't make, want to make it too high level, so we tried to find the right way that we knew how to talk about where to put the security pieces. So, and okay. we, and we found, we developed, we found we could, we could talk to the waterfall guys, we could talk to the agile guys. 
you can actually fit a container pipeline in here. Yeah, we, which we have. Yeah. So this was our, our map, and we have our security services across the top. This is how we were trying to communicate to people well, well, how we fit in to the work that they're doing. So this was our starting point. And then? Well, you know, so we were discussing all this, and we're just about to launch two of the processes. We were, about. yeah. <laughs> and he, well, Joe Biden, uh, his executive cybersecurity order, we better go and have a good look at this. <laughs> and I think everybody probably knows broadly what's in there, you know, protect uh, the federal government, protect the infrastructure. There's a big section in it called secure software supply chains. And this is in response to solar winds. Yeah. Um, and of course, then it's the S-bomb. The S bomb. I've been doing bills of materials for a long time. Generally, they're in your make file or your manifest. Do you check on the other end? Do you attest? Do you verify? So, this is a standards based S bomb, okay? One that's transferable and interchangeable. And, and this gave us some leverage because 3M does a lot of business with the federal government and other, other defense departments and stuff. And we're saying, guys, they're taking this very seriously. We need to make sure we're staying ahead of the game because you never want to be caught behind where they're like, I need this by next month. And you're like, well, we don't do that yet. So we need to make sure we deliver whatever it is that they look like they're going to ask for it. And I'm like, oh, hey, we've already got plans for these things. This is good. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I'm not a security guy at that stage. Well, I am, but I think everybody <laughs> should be a security guy. I think everybody should be a DevOps guy. It's not that guy over there's fault. We're all in this game together. And it's resonating with me. And we're going, hang on, we've been trying to get ahead of this game, and they're talking about it. Yeah. What happens next? This. Well, two days later, <laughs> two days later, this wonderful document drops from the CNCF. And I'm doing my normal examination of what's new in the world of hacking and software supply chains. The document comes out, it is a wonderful document. I read it, I said to Ryan, I said, Ryan, you know, we're not that far off, you know. We got to put some more meat in the bone, but look what we're just after getting here from the CNCF document. So, recommended reading for everybody in the room. So what is it about? And for me, it's about principles and standards at the high level. There's really good governance. There's really good principles about your risk environments, your risk appetite, but general principles of trust. Trust at every stage and every job in the pipeline. So attestation and verification. Uh, it's high on that. It's also high on automation. Better, faster, cheaper, better, faster, cheaper. No, no. Better, faster, cheaper, and more secure, okay? So that you have consistency. The investment in automation is paid back later because you have consistency. Less effort, it's automated. Clarity at every stage. Know where it happens, control that environment. Build nodes, as we heard earlier on, hardening your pipelines. You must be able to reproduce the build at any time and anybody else who needs to do it. People think often, you know, oh, we'll move the source code system from here to here. Yeah, we'll just lift and shift it. No, you've got to bring the pipelines, the processes, and all the builds with them. Which means, okay, bit for bit, byte for byte, your artifact at the end has to be the same before and after that migration. So clarity is really important. And then, of course, the MFA, mutual authentication. Every step of the way, everybody needs to be authorized and accessed and certified. So that's critical, OK? So what does the document actually have in it? And lo and behold, it breaks down the software supply chain, securing your source code, protect your code at rest. OK, so there's 22 good principles in there that everybody should be looking at how to secure the integrity of your code, your access to your code, the integrity of your environments. And there's some pretty high bars that you would have to meet, signing your source code with GPG and MIME keys. It's difficult for some systems to achieve. Yeah, and, and also, in these controls that each of the section have, or each of the, the statements or requirements, there's different levels. What would you do if you're just trying to low, and this is kind of like for public people, public repositories, for medium, or moderate level, moderate. Which, which would be more like internal system, confidential types of things. And then high, which would be? Missile systems, yeah. air traffic control, banking, PHI yeah. data, okay? And some of these are a high bar to achieve. And when you assess that, you look at it. And don't forget all the branch protections and all those configuration, source code management, 101 stuff. It's all there, but called out in clear principles to remind us. Next section is securing the materials. So you have your source code. 
and you have all your materials, where do your materials come from? Okay, so a lot of OSS and probably some cuts off the shelf tools as well. Okay, so attestation, SEA analysis, SBOMs from your vendors, and again, verification, automation, all the way through. Some really good practices there, I think 33. Um, when you get down into securing your build pipelines, that's a great section of the document. Everybody should read it on the presentation earlier on, uh, securing your build pipelines with Kubernetes and Tecton. Yeah, that was nice. I think they're hitting a lot of the bells there, yeah, but that, you know, question. what we're talking about is immutable pipelines, okay, so that nobody can get in. The administrator's not getting in there and changing it on the fly. We don't want any snowflakes. Um, we want to have build workers that are reproducible continuously, typically now in a container that you can spin it up and it is certified as well. So in Toto is big here, big recommendation. Very high bar to reach, but we're going, hang on, let's not let perfect get in the way of better, okay? It's a journey, we're yeah. on this journey, yeah. through Amazon, this journey, digital transformation is a journey. We have to go there, but don't be put off by some of that really high level stuff. Right. Measure your risk appetite to where you are. Well, that's part of how we'd recommend using this is find the ones that work for your organization. You don't want it to be too far of a reach. You also don't want to make it too easy. So we spend a lot of time like moderate plus maybe this one and this one or, you know. Security artifacts at the end of the build, okay? So you got your build, you got your manufacturer, put it in a repo, okay? Put a checksum on it, put a hash on it, promote it to your QA environments. Make sure that it's the same one with the same license and all the same code in it that your team actually released. Promote that through your environment. Do your unit test, system test, integration test, performance test, all of your tests. When you're ready to go, you might bring it closer to a target environment. That's where it should come from. Just your CD is taking it and putting it out there. And then the last piece, the CD, yep. okay? Yep. Make sure, and we've spoken already today about the TUF framework. It's big on the TUF framework there. So attestation, verification, clarity, trust, every step in the way, and then least privilege and separation of duties and reproducibility and automation. This is gold dust, this document. Okay, very good. So Connor, what did you do when the document came out? Well, I had to read it a few times. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I read it a couple of times since I left Dublin. We're, we're both in Dublin <laughs> here at the moment. This and is light reading. Every time I read it, I was reading it, I get, I get a new one. I, and it's just going, oh, I have to think about that again. You know, what are we going to do? So what do we do? Well, you broke it out. I did. I parsed it out into clauses, and I put the clauses into categories. And he's like, Ryan, check this out. I've got this whole thing in a big spreadsheet for you. I'm like, wow. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then Ryan goes, well, that's amazing. And that's good. But hang on. How are we going to make this work for 3M? Yeah. Because 3M has its own culture and its own vernacular. Right. OK, and we got to translate that into the words people commonly right. use. But we had a framework, OK? so. It gave us a good reference. It told us where we were weak. It told us where we were strong. It told us some bits that we hadn't covered. So, and then we took, we took those phrases, those different pieces. We simplified the language a little bit to make it more consumable. And then we, went, we, we kind of put it in the controls list. And I'm like, I've done this before. I, I've done, this looks like a controls framework. So I put it on the bottom. You see, I put control objectives and numberings on there and who's the owner and evidence required and everything else. We just start filling it out like this. And, and it was quite enlightening as we went through. We started seeing a lot of patterns and, and we had some great discussions when we came up with, well, what evidence, what would we expect someone to give there us if they were going there to meet go. this control? And these would be, this would be targeted more for the tool chain owners and less towards the application owners, right? So. Absolutely. And then, <clears throat> you know, audit, control, policy, these are big hammers that you can bring into an organization, but we're a team that yeah. likes solutions, yeah. okay? Yeah. We do so not want to leave with How it. good are our current <laughs> solutions? Uh, how do they measure up against this? Yeah. You know, uh, which ones, how do these different tool sets measure up against each other? Because we would like to converge, but not necessarily be completely rigid. And, and how not to make friends is to come in with this real hard requirement that there's no tool to be able to do yet and say, go figure it out, right? That, that's a terrible position yeah, to put yeah. people Your in. Your baby so, is ugly. We yeah, don't so do that. We're like, let's, let's find out what we can do, and then we're going to work with the tool owners, yeah. and we come to them, and we're going to say, our job right now is to make you the gold standard for the company. We're going to try to get you up to that level. So, so work with us for a few months. We're going to do an assessment of your tool, find out where we're deficient, see if we can get some items on the backlog, and see if we can get these things fixed for the different tools that are supporting this out there. 
And the natural way that conversation worked is after they saw that initial pass, they're either, oh yeah, okay, well that's doable. We can, we can fix those things and we'll secure this pipeline. Or, yeah, our technology, we just can't do that. <laughs> We're gonna decommission this and move to some one of the more modern ones, which is great. I didn't have to be the bad guy. We're just like, hey. Yeah, they'll admit to it, you know, but respectful conversations, transparent conversations, collaboration, yeah. partnership, really important. But we do come in with the know-how and the show-how. Yep. The show-how is, how do you actually prove that you uh, rotate your keys? Yeah. You know? So here's a couple of examples of how we do this, and we can get into more detail if, we, if people want to, get, uh, to have questions later, but here's two of them I just pulled out. One's a little fudged, because I, well, first I had to get this through legal review, and second, I didn't have a lot of screen space, I wanted to just put this together. So first one would be securing your source code. So are you doing secret scanning, or preventing secrets from getting in? Well. Secrets preventing, um, false positives cause problems, and we're still working on the prevention part. But we said, for right now, let's just make sure we've got scanning, make sure that it's um, finding stuff, that it's on, and that developers are getting these findings. And it's going to the vulnerability team, too, so they can help track. That, that's where we want to be for right now. Um, the lucky person who's the owner would be the owner of the GitHub or TFS or whatever technology was doing this, and we want to make sure the secret scanner is working. So then I can report on their stewardship of that technology. Yeah, and we're not bringing somebody who like to shine the lights into their eyes, you know, we're saying, tell us how we can help you improve this. Should you be doing this? Or is this can a service we this? should provide you so you can do this, right? That's yeah. the approach. So second one, securing materials, um, software composition analysis, those are like your black ducks and sonotypes and other things. Um, you can either integrate black duck or whatever tool into your pipeline and make sure that scan's happening every time, or you can just have to get your stuff, like they just mentioned, from Artifactory or Nexus that's already been wrapped and approved and nothing gets in unless it's approved. And so as long as you're pulling your stuff from that, then you meet this control. So this is kind of the approach that we took on how we get the evidence. And it depends on, you know, obviously this is subdivided and there's multiple, a little bit more complicated. But the other groups don't need to see that. They just need to know we've got it organized and it's by person who can actually oh, make Ron, it. Ron, you also, you also interleave some of that with some standard controls that we actually have for logging and monitoring yeah, and all right, everything. Right. We also had to move some pieces around a little bit because we had a two-year strategy and we didn't want to go, ah, no, it's, it's what we had, we wanted to pin our strategy at the top and then have those capabilities underneath. So, for example, uh, DAS scanning. We can put DAS scanning into merge clean components, okay, or possibly in the QA. However, SCA, we put it there. And also, yeah. I think, Ryan, uh, the building artifacts, the storing the artifacts and clean deployments, that's a lot to take in for somebody. So we crushed that into yeah. secure to build pipeline. We'll talk about that in, yeah. in just a sec. In fact, maybe I'll skip to it now. So we, I'll skip to the strategy and we'll talk about how it helped. But we took the structure that they had and kind of used it to simplify. So. Um, you know, secure, build, and deploy became, we kind of merged a couple of those in, and, and now we have definitions behind all of it. Like, I know how to assess people against those different things. That's your software build materials, certified build pipeline, certified delivery mechanisms, all those things. And we just simplified the strategy in general because, you know, license and components were kind of, you know, they, they merged it in, the, in the, the best practices document, and we're like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So it helped us to simplify our message. We aligned it with the best practices document, and, and this is really easy to communicate to really executives. Good. I can go in and say, here's what a software, secure software supply chain looks like. You have these pieces. By the way, here's our strategy. You implement this, and you have a secure software supply chain. And they just go, well, great. What do you need? I mean, it's a much easier conversation. It because is. They, they ask us to come there because something like Log4j happens. And it's so nice when you've got this plan. And I, I know how much time it's going to take. We, we didn't get into this, but we yeah. can talk about um, you know, resources and ROI for this and yeah, all the other cost, things we've had together. Cost. Yeah, Ryan deeply understands how to get that message up there. What does value mean? Security costs, okay, but it also reduces costs, okay? If you have automated security, you can prove reduced costs. Your, CI, your CFO may not understand SDLC and the secure software supply chain, but he can understand our supply chain <laughs> and he can understand cost reduction and effort reduction. Yeah, and that's a big one. So with this, one thing I found really, really helpful is to actually get good estimates on how much time it would take to do this manually or how much time it would be if you can automate this. 
And I, we actually put that into hours, and we deliver that monthly. And it was really painful at the beginning, but as you do anything, you iterate on it, you get better at it and better at it. So now I can show every month both legacy projects, we kind of get a residual because it still helps those, but any new project that comes in, I'm like, if you were to do this manually, would it have taken you this long? Our tools do it in this much time, right? Exactly. It's automated. And the CFOs love that kind of stuff because they're like, well, I can spend money because I see my ROI here, and it's, it's legitimate. They have to do it either way. You might as well do it the fast, easy, automated way, and we're helping you do that. Absolutely, and remember I mentioned the old style CMDB? Well, that was fine when you had 20 servers, but now we've got containers with very short life cycles. So this dynamic inventory of where is it? Where has it gone to? How did it get there? If you have your operations teams continually trying to figure out what's yeah. out there, <laughs> and they don't know because there's been no trail back, no audit trail, no yeah. release note with the S-bomb, where did it go to? That's your cost saving right there. So we've talked about how, we only have a couple minutes left, we've talked about how it really helped having this best practices document come and reinforce our strategy and now we can leverage an industry standard and we're talking to all these tool owners and I mean it was just really nice in that perspective. Um, but I just and, want to end with this. Yeah. So here's some advice and lessons learned along the way. <laughs> we did not do everything right. In fact, I bet some of the stuff we're doing now is wrong. So if you have ideas, we'd love to hear from them. Um, we just we learn and we fail and we do better next time. Uh, but look, look, we're, we're, we're open like, and transparent, right? We're open and transparent. We like making new mistakes. <laughs> That's right. Don't make the same okay. mistakes. Um, create these alliances of partnership. Like we, we're never trying to embarrass teams. We always want to give people plenty of time before the results are published, um, before anything comes to you know. So we always work with the groups trying to get things up before other people find out yeah. about it. Uh, and absolutely, we, we don't want to crush them into a corner and we want people to be open with us, so we're very respectful. We understand their problems from a security perspective and from a development perspective. Yep. But we want them to acknowledgement as the first part to that journey. Yep. And we've made lots of friends along the way. I mean, it's, this is ultimately, I'm convinced, a culture change. It's a culture change for how developers do their work in a lot of cases, for how managers prioritize the work, and for how people pay for software. I mean. There was a paradigm, especially in some of the acquisitions, where it's like, hey, we're just going to do, um, you know, we're going to do things really agile. We're going to use all free software, and it's going to be super cheap, and we don't have to pay for licenses that way, and we can just be fast. And we're like, um, okay, well, show me how you meet these requirements with this thing you've cobbled together over yeah. a weekend. And so, if you're going to meet all these security requirements, it's better to use one of the items on what we call the paved road, right? If you use this technology and this co component management and this pipeline and this things, we will do your the compliance stuff for you, because it's all already automated. If you do it by yourself, I'm gonna need all these deliverables, all this evidence to show me that you're doing it. And so it kind of restricts um, the people adding risk because they're doing it on their own way a little bit, and, yeah. and also gets more engagement in the big processes, because if those aren't working for them, they need to give that feedback so we can add the features. And So we that. don't come in with the policy framework and say, no, 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 this is wrong. We'll come in with a paved road, okay? We build solutions and we go, how about, this way over here, look. You know, yep. This is the way Absolutely. it works. And guess what? Leaders lead those who want to follow. We want everybody to be security. They'll come with us. There will be an ugly tail, perhaps. Yep. But guess what? You know, policy will harden as we improve it, behind us. And then, you know, we're making it easier for developers to do the right thing. And not, as Ryan says, dumping to the left. Yeah, we're not dumping to the left. It's all about people. Um, these are professionals. They want to do what's right. If you show them the right way to do it, we've found that they just love it. They're, they're very grateful for, hey, good. Thank you for letting me know exactly what was needed, giving me the tools to do it. Right? I, I haven't found anyone in 3M that's like, nah, I want to do things insecure. Like, yeah. Nobody says that. <laughs> they, they say, well, I'd like to do that, but I'm getting all these business pressure. Right? So we can give them some air cover by talking to their executives and making sure that they've got the air cover. And, and also, well, what you're asking me to do is really, really hard. Can you help make it easy? Yeah, we can do that. And if you do that, we found that we have really great results and it's been a great journey. And Connor is legitimate. This guy, he's fantastic. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with him. And when he's done helping us, you guys should be lining up at the door to get, <laughs> get well, help. Well, I just want to say <laughs> it's a pleasure to be on the stage here. I can talk techie and he can talk leadership. It's a pleasure to work with him. But most importantly, to say thank you to the CNCF. Yeah, great document. I don't know how much time we have, if we have time for questions, or you can talk to us after, it doesn't matter. We could probably get one. Okay, one question. I guess they're talking to you after. They're talking to us after then. 
so you talk too fast, Connor. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan comes from Utah, but he's, he's, his inner Irish man is coming out. That's I, it. I'm I not even allowed hat. to kiss the Blarney Stone. I didn't bring I my hat. Just go. Darn it. I was going to wear my hat up here. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.